back to Tokyo, there's a real feeling of nostalgia and I want to look around and see how much great food there really is here. Great restaurants, top quality, literally everywhere I turn. I kind of feel like I'm missing out a little bit, but that's, this is what it is. This is why Tokyo is such a fantastic place. We're traveling all the way through Japan, but it all comes together right here. And I think this is the real heart of Japanese cuisine. That's what makes it the world's greatest food city. Success here requires a pursuit of perfection. I'm going to dine with the inspirational chef behind Asia's best restaurant, Narisawa. It's not just the creation of a dish, it's the creation of an experience. Then it's over to my favorite yakitori master for a virtuoso performance with chicken. It has to be eaten in one mouthful. There's fun food for kids. <laughs> I'm quite proud of that. And a Japanese style hamburger made especially for eating with rice. department store in Nihonbashi, one of Tokyo's grand old department stores. This lady's presenting the rose of the day to show that it's opening up for the morning. And although this is a great place to buy your luxury goods and your handbags and things, the real secret's downstairs, and that's the food. From humble beginnings as a shop selling cotton and used clothing all the way back in the Edo period, Takashimaya is now one of Japan's largest and grandest department stores. Its incomparable service and impeccable quality are a hit with stylish Japanese consumers. But you don't come here to save money. This is the ultimate shopping experience. Traveling the entire length of Japan is a great privilege, but if you're not quite as lucky as me, you can actually come to a place like this, a depachika, under the department store where they bring the best of Japan all together in one place, whether it's jellies from Saitama or pickles that have come up on the train first thing in the morning from Kyoto. It's a food lover's paradise down here. When you walk through here, it's hard not to be impressed with the produce that you see. Everything is absolutely pristine, smooth skin, not a blemish anywhere. These are the supermodels of fruit and vegetable, for better or worse. If you're looking for perfection in fruit, this is the place to come. They have different types of fruit here that are intended as gifts for people and they can reach extraordinary prices like $90 for a single mango or even $130, $40 for one muskmelon. And this is something very Japanese. All different types of umeboshi or salted plums categorized by the size of the plum and also the amount of salt and color that's been put into them. So these ones are 14% salt and these ones are 20% salt. Over here, there's nori seaweed, 50 different kinds. Anything you want in Japanese cuisine, you can find right here. And this is something that's become increasingly popular in Asia throughout recent years. This is vinegar, but just for drinking. This one here is gobo and jasmine, burdock root and jasmine. Very complex and earthy flavor, but floral from the jasmine as well. Interesting stuff. Takashimaya's Depachika is a brilliant introduction to Tokyo's food culture. But the next step is to start exploring the top restaurants. In many ways, you can consider Tokyo a city of experiences. And this restaurant here is often considered to be one of the best in the world. But they do something slightly different. This isn't just food, it's art. This year, Yoshihiro Narisawa's two Michelin star restaurant was named by San Pellegrino as Asia's best. But with dishes like Soil 2013 and Winter Springs, it's clear Yoshihiro is a man whose culinary inspirations go far beyond the normal. Fine dining is called fine dining. それから新しい発見、知識として知らないことを知ることができたりっていう
Up first is Winter Springs, a dish inspired by Yoshihiro's foraging trips along the mountain streams of Nagano. Wasabi root is slowly infused into mountain spring water over several hours using this rotary evaporator. The liquid is chilled to three degrees and served in small pools like splashes on glass, frozen in time. Then wild baby herbs are placed around the gel as if sprouting out of the water. It's just incredibly delicate. The flavour of the water infused with wasabi isn't hot like wasabi, it's just it's perfumed essentially. And then these leaves around that have been sprayed with seawater have a slight saltiness to them to give it a really lovely flavour. And it does, it tastes, it tastes wonderful, it tastes fresh. And it's not just the creation of a dish, it's the creation of an experience. I've come to a, a great restaurant, but I'm getting the experience of plucking baby herbs from around a, a winter spring in the cold of the mountains. Next on the list is a dish called Soil 2013. And believe it or not, soil is actually the main ingredient. On one of his many visits to Nagano, Yoshihiro noticed that one particular field was lush and rich, while those around it were frozen and dead. He took a sample, had it analysed, and the result is this dish. Mountain soil boiled with water and burdock root and frothed into a foamy soup. To say that the aroma is earthy is kind of trite in a way, because it's the earth. This is the essence of the earth, and wow. It's actually very nice, you know. It, it's strange to be served soil in a restaurant like this, but it's, it's light in flavour, it's minerally. It's very sweet, strangely enough, considering that it hasn't had any sugar or anything added to it. It actually tastes beautiful. It, it, it's surprising to me, but it really does. Now for the meat. In a dish called sumi, or charcoal, Narusawa uses Hida Wagyu rump from Gifu Prefecture and to achieve perfectly uniform taste and texture he nappes the beef for about half an hour in a warm mix of olive oil and butter. Then he makes charcoal using a dry roasting process that's centuries old. But instead of making charcoal from wood, he uses leeks. The leek charcoal is ground to an edible powder and used to coat the beef. Finally, it's served with a red wine jus and Japanese merlot. Visually, the impact of this coming to the table is that you're eating a lump of coal. There's a, a glowing red ember inside, and it's, it's coal on the outside. But when you, you taste it, it is, it's of course delicious, I don't even need to say that to you, but in a dish like this and in an experience like this, the God is really in the details. What sets this aside and what makes this special is the essence of charcoal that you get with it. If you think of the process that's gone into it, it's making charcoal from wood and then taking that charcoal and making charcoal from leeks with it. And that's the difference. That's what the real defining factor of this dish is. It's not the meat, it's not the sauce, it's the charcoal and the, the different layer that that adds on top of it. One of the best things I've ever had. やっぱりそうですね。料理人だったりレストランというのは常に自然と共存しなければいけないんで、もう大事な役割だと思ってますので、世界中にメッセージを発信していきたいと思ってます。Tokyo is a magnet. It attracts ideas, ambition, energy and youth. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. So what happens to those little towns on the outskirts? Well, sadly, all too often, they die. Here in the town of Fukaya in Saitama Prefecture, just an hour by train from Tokyo, that slow death was already starting to happen. 
but rather than slipping away person by person and building by building, the community in this town got together and they've done something really special here. A bunch of people and businesses that have come together to reinvigorate this old sake brewery. The library and bookshop is run by a poet and writer who set up a school here to teach local kids about Japanese history and culture. The local tea supplier set up this traditional tea shop to cater for the ever-increasing visitors and day-trippers coming from Tokyo. The community centre needed somewhere to eat, so a former restaurant manager who had never picked up a knife before suddenly got the job of chef. And it turns out he makes a pretty good curry. And there's a cinema that plays the latest movies. But it's the tofu shop out the front here that interests me the most. Chieko Nakanishi used to work for a big manufacturing company. When the company downsized, she and her colleagues lost their jobs. And so to keep themselves employed and to keep the money coming in, they started Tofu Kobo and set out on a quest to make Japan's best tofu. え、毎日お豆腐を作る、私が作り続けるのは、もうあの、えっと、今まで18年近く、近くてきたね。あの、ま、こう、地域の、えっと、方たちとのつながりで、あの、ま、安心安全なものをお届けしている、ま、あの、
from the lemon. Sometimes you can use vinegar if you like, but I prefer a citrus-based ponzu myself. This has been boiling now for a minute or so. So I turn it off and put in the old favourites. Some kombu. Some of this katsu bushi, nido flakes. And on top of that as well, soy sauce. Touch of sugar as well to offset the soy sauce. And then in there where I combined lemon and yuzu juice. Of course, we don't want to lose the flavor from this zest. So I'll just pop that in there to infuse as well. So we can set that aside overnight if you can, but at least for an hour. The fragrance of it is just sensational already. So now with very clean hands, just pick up the tofu and break it apart. It's got a lovely texture to it, this kind of firm tofu after it's been pressed. And it's this creamy texture that's going to make such a difference to our tofu hamburger. Then add in our beef mince, about 400 grams, just to that season it with. A lot of salt. I'm going to add some grated onion. It's looking good, so I'll add in a few extra flavorings. Some black pepper. And also some nutmeg. And finally, an egg. Looks good. Get this straight into the fry pan. Try and get a little crust on the outside of it. We want to be very delicate with it. Japanese hamburgers don't go between two pieces of bread. They go in on a plate by themselves and they're eaten with rice. So that light and fluffy texture is really what you're looking for, something that's going to match well with rice. Time to flip it over. That looks great. Add in a splash of sake. You could also use water or white wine or even stock. Get that steaming away and cover it up. While the burger cooks through, I'll prepare some daikon. It's grated, then squeezed through muslin to remove some of its bitterness. And the result is a hot, light addition to the burger topping. Our ponzu's been infusing. And it's got a wonderful citrus aroma, fragrance from the yuzu. It's very savoury as well from the umami and that seaweed and katsuobushi. Strain that out. Egg is ready now, so I pull that out. On top of that, some of our daikon, grated daikon oroshi. Scatter it with some spring onions. This is one of my favorite ingredients. This is itto togarashi, dried chili threads. They've got a wonderful aroma to them, actually from Korean cooking, but very popular in Japan. And then to finish it off, just some of this ponzu. And now for the second recipe, dressed silken tofu. Simply turn drained tofu onto a plate, grate some ginger, then add chives and bonito flakes. Our Japanese tofu hamburger and our cold dressed tofu hiyayako. With a drizzle of this tamari over the top, it's going to be absolutely perfect. Good enough to eat. There's no shortage of fine dining restaurants in Japan. You can find them everywhere. Even down the end of this alley, past the crates and the bins, this is one of my favourite restaurants in the entire world, and it's all about yakitori. Yoshiteru Ikigawa owns and runs Torishiki, a yakitori restaurant that's earned a Michelin star. Yoshiteru specialises in omakase, a style of eating similar to a degustation, 
where the meal is tailor-made to each diner and delivered one small piece at a time. Yoshitera is like a dancer moving elegantly around his space, observing his guests and expertly timing the delivery of each and every skewer. In Western cooking, sometimes you can think of a single chicken being limited to a thigh and drumstick and a breast and a wing, but Ikigawa-san here can get 20 different cuts out of one bird. The first piece Yoshitero creates for me is a skewer called chochu or lantern. It's a combination of liver, fallopian tube and a chicken ovum. That's the yolk of an egg taken from inside the chicken before the egg is formed. <laughs> it's a wonderful chewy texture. You can't escape the fact that you're eating something that is not normally eaten as part of the chicken. It's really, to me, sums up the experience of this restaurant, getting something unique, something full of thought that also tastes wonderful. One after another, delicious skewers arrive at exactly the right moment. Not too soon, and never too late. If you think about the complexity of it, at a lot of yakitori places in Japan, you might get five or six skewers just sort of plonked down in front of you. But Ikigawa-san's not timing just the meal, but also each mouthful. He can see when someone's finished. You know the feeling of when you're eating and a waiter comes and asks you, how's everything going? That would never happen here because Ikigawa-san is watching you chew. He's watching your enjoyment of each piece to decide what comes next and also when to give it to you. Thing about Japan that you can find Zen and philosophy in almost everything, even a little stick of chicken. In this nondescript apartment block is a champion, a mum who sees every single one of her kids' school lunches as a work of art. In Japan, it's called character bento, or karaben, and it's big business. What started as a sneaky way to get kids to eat healthy food has evolved into national competitions, websites, and even magazines. If you ever had any problems getting your kids to eat their lunches, I reckon this might be the answer. You take a bunch of leftovers from last night's dinner and a few new ingredients and you create something that is absolutely a work of art. Higure-san is a professional bento maker making lunch boxes and it started from when her kids were very young and she wanted to make eating fun. Hi. Okay, this journey is all about new experiences. So here goes, my first attempt at a character bento. Make a small well inside the rice ball and this is some plate salmon going inside. First time we've ever done this, so fingers crossed it turns out okay. The bento that we're making is three different characters and they've all got different coloured faces, so what higure is doing here is flavouring the rice and also colouring it so that it looks different and has a different taste. It's just an, an interesting thing for a kid to eat. We're using soy sauce to colour the face of our cat, tomato sauce to make a pink pig, and the panda stays white. This is halfway between cooking and arts and crafts, and I'm actually very much enjoying it. This is a really great trick. She uses dry pasta to, to stick all of the, the ears and things onto our panda. And even though it's hard now, by the time her son gets to eat it at lunchtime, it's softened and, and absorbed the water from the ingredients so it doesn't stick in his mouth. <laughs> Quite proud of that. It's actually a lot of fun. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm enjoying making this this pinto an awful lot. I can only imagine how much more I would have been enjoying it if I was six or seven years old. I kind of feel like I am at the moment though. So now it's simply a matter of putting all the pieces together. 
and there it is, a literal legend in a lunchbox. Next time, I travel to the heart of traditional Japanese culture, Kyoto. A thousand different varieties on a thousand different ways. I experience the famed tea ceremony, a micro drinking party, and discover a food scene that's far from old-fashioned. It's a lot of fun to eat.